So I've argued that the path of real interest rates that is consistent with the FOMC's dual mandate objectives, what one might call the mandate consistent path of real interest rates, has fallen greatly since 2007. So in 2007, real interest rates were 2.5% over the next five years, 2.5% over the next 10 years, and that was broadly consistent with the FOMC's objectives. Now they're much lower, and they're still too high relative to the FOMC being able to achieve its objectives. And now I turn to a discussion of why this has happened. I see the decline in mandate consistent real interest rates is grounded in an increase in the demand for and, the, and a, fall of, a fall in the supply of, so an increase in the demand for and a fall in the supply of safe financial investment vehicles. And importantly, I see these changes as highly likely, uh, as likely to be highly persistent. So we talk first of the demand side. And there, there's just many factors underlying the increased demand for safe assets. And I'll just emphasize three that, uh, that strike me as particularly important. The three I'm going to talk about are tighter credit access, heightened perceptions of macroeconomic risk, and uh, increased uncertainty about federal fiscal policy. So let me uh, start with credit access. I don't think that it's controversial to say that credit access is more limited than in 2007. What is less generally realized, I think, is that when you put restrictions on households and businesses' ability to borrow, that typically leads them to spend less and save more, to want to hold more safe assets. Let me, let me try to illustrate this point through an example. Think about a household that wants to buy a house. In 2007, that household could have received a mortgage with a down payment of 10% of the purchase price, possibly even lower. In 2013, that same household is considerably more likely to need a down payment of 20%. These tighter mortgage standards mean that to buy a similarly priced home, the household needs to first acquire more assets. And this is just one example of a much more pervasive phenomenon. So this is one reason why I see the demand for safe assets as having risen, because of tighter limits on credit access. It's also risen because of households and businesses' assessments of macroeconomic risk. As of 2007, the United States had just gone through nearly 25 years of macroeconomic tran tran tranquility. As a consequence, relatively few workers or businesses are macroeconomists in the United States saw a severe macroeconomic shock as possible. Now, in the wake of the Great Recession and the not so great recovery, the story is a different one. More workers see themselves as being exposed to the risk of per persistent deterioration in labor incomes. More businesses see themselves exposed to the risk of a radical and persistent downshift in the demand for their products. These workers and businesses have an incentive to accumulate more safe assets as a way to self-insure against this enhanced macroeconomic risk. So the two, first two things I want to talk about, tightened credit access and a heightened perception of macroeconomic risk. The final uh, uh, source of uncertainty I'll emphasize, the final uh, source of extra demand, I should say, is on the in terms of the federal fiscal situation, which is another key source of elevated uncertainty. The federal government faces a long-run disconnect between its overt commitments and the baseline path of federal tax collections. This disconnect can only be resolved by raising taxes and or cutting the long-run arc of spending. Now, this tension between revenues and expenditure predates the 2007 downturn, long predates it. But it's at least arguable that the fiscal debates of the past few years have made more Americans aware of the uncertainties associated with resolving this long-run disconnect. These uncertainties, again, affect the demand for safe assets. For example, on the business side, the prospect of higher future uh, corporate profits taxes gives businesses an incentive to demand safe short-term financial assets as opposed to engaging in long-term investments. On the household side, so that's a, the the business side, I emphasize the possibility of an increase in taxes. On the household side, 
the prospect of a reduction in Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security gives some households an incentive to demand more safe assets as a way of replacing these lost potential benefits. So whether you're thinking about cutting benefits or raising taxes, both of those can have an increase in, uh, generate an increase in demand for safe assets. <laughs> so that's all on the, on the demand side. Do in part, and these are three, I think, of, as I suggest, many factors. Uh, part to tighter credit access and higher uncertainty. The demand for safe financial assets has risen since 2007. Now, at the same time, on the supply side, the global supply of assets perceived as safe has also fallen. Americans and many others around the world thought in 2007 that it was highly unlikely that American residential land and assets backed by American residential land could ever fall in value by 30%. Similarly, investors around the world viewed all forms of European sovereign debt as a safe investment. Neither of these statements are true anymore. So the FOMC is confronted with a greater demand for safe assets and a tighter supply of safe assets than was true in 2007. Now what these changes in asset markets mean is that at any given level of real interest rates, households and businesses spend less. Their decline in spending pushes down on both prices and employment. And as a result, the FOMC has to lower its real interest rate in order to achieve its objectives. Now I often hear, uh, as I go around giving, uh, giving, giving speeches, I often hear questions or comments to the effect that the FOMC has created a low interest rate environment that is harmful for savers and others. But to return to my winter wear analogy, this seems about as compelling as blaming me for creating winter in Minnesota by putting on my long johns. The FOMC has been confronted with wintry changes in asset demand and asset supply. It has lowered the real interest rate to keep the economy warmer in light of these changes. Indeed, as I, just, I suggested earlier, the weak macroeconomic outlook suggests that the FOMC has in fact not put on a warm enough coat. That is, that is, it has not lowered the real interest rate sufficiently. So that's where we are. What about the future? The passage of time will, I think, ameliorate these changes in the demand for and supply of safe assets, but only partially. Now, any long-run forecast, and uh, any short-run forecast for that matter, but it's even more true of long-run forecasts, has enormous attendant uncertainties. But I do expect that for a considerable period of time, credit market, uh, possibly the next five to 10 years, credit market access will remain limited relative to what borrowers had available in 2007. I expect that many workers and businesses will remain more concerned than in 2007 about the risk of a large adverse recessionary shock. And I also expect that businesses will continue to feel a heightened degree of uncertainty about taxes, and households will continue to feel a heightened degree of uncertainty about the level of federal government uh, benefits. These considerations suggest that for many years to come, the FOMC will have to maintain low real interest rates in order to achieve its congressionally mandated goals. 